Undertale Yellow, the fan-made Undertale prequel, has finally been released, and I absolutely love it. But I ended up forgetting to add the music to the stream, so uh, this is awkward. I didn't intend for this to be a scripted video. The game starts with our character looking for the previous humans who never returned from climbing Mount Abbott. And unlike Undertale, Clover just straight up jumps down the mountain. We fall down to the ruins just like every other human, and after encountering our froggit instead of Flowey, Toriel comes to save us and guides us through the catacombs. However, things would soon take a turn because after flipping a switch, the ground beneath us crumbles and we fall down to the depths. Luckily, we landed on golden flowers, and after spending an embarrassingly long time searching for this goddamn door, we encounter Flowey, who actually appears to be helping us. He teaches us about dodging attacks and even acts as our save point. After saying goodbye without even telling him my name, we encounter our first new enemy, Flyer. And I'm not gonna go over every single detail about him, because he feels nothing. By comforting him once, we can spare him and move on to our first real puzzle, which I solve very easily. Then we meet this Ralsei and that's Fluke hybrid, who we will soon know to be named Delve. In the next room, we encounter another brand new monster who was way too obsessed with drawing. I try to be a good person and compliment her work, but apparently that makes her uncomfortable. Sorry, I guess. In retaliation, she dealt 6 damage to me on her turn, but when it came back to me, I told Penella that all of us could use a break at some point, and she left. I headed forward and found myself in a corn maze, which looked daunting at first, but after hugging this excited piece of corn, I realized that it was actually really easy. We meet up with Della for the second time, flip another switch, then go down to fight a mirror whose name was just Mirror Backwards. This was the first fight that required two steps to spare. First we had to smile, and then we had to critique our own appearance. I know I don't like the way I look, but you don't gotta make me admit that. After forgetting that encounter ever existed, there appears to be a drawing on the pillar, which I can only assume to be Mimikyu. But no, it's just a cat. Or pillar. Keeping up with the Pokemon references, our first boss is against Noibat, sorry, Desabat. And at first, I thought you weren't supposed to make a sound, because not only is he missing his quiet solitude, but he also uses blue attacks. So I just kept watching him for a few turns before realizing that this isn't doing anything. I tried to talk to him, but that just made him furious. The only other option was to shoo him away, which to me felt like the wrong option. But no, it was right. Our next battle was against Crispy Scroll, who attacks really quickly. I actually came pretty close to dying considering he deals 4 damage per hit, but after matching his loud voice twice, we can move on to this dark hallway. I found a feather here which somehow gives me defense, and then I came face to face with Delve for the third time. He takes off his Ralsei hood and we begin our second boss fight. Delve really just wants to be left alone, but I have to get out of this place so I stood my ground. And by that, I mean I stalled out 10 turns and offered him a handshake. So uh, we're friends now. And after snooping around his house, we can leave the ruins for good. We talked to Flowey and Snowden for a bit, and right as we were about to leave, he realizes that he doesn't remember my name. To not be rude, he just starts improvising and says my name is Gun Pat. And I could just act like that's my name, but he's been nice to me, so I'll correct him on that. I don't know what I was expecting for the first Snowden monster, but it definitely wasn't an igloo. But something wasn't quite right. So the best course of action is to dance in front of it and reveal that it's actually just a frostermid. By dancing one more time, he can spare the little guy, then encounter Martlet, who is essentially the replacement for Papyrus. She sets up a puzzle that we have to complete by moving these logs to allow the lava rock to melt the ice, and after spending longer than I should have on it, we meet this idiot who has his tongue stuck to a pole. And I just want to say, how stupid can you possibly be to lick a pole, let alone lick a pole in this weather? The next monster we have to fight is an Insomnitot, who is way up past its bedtime. But if you're unaware of what time it is, it's fine, right? I decided to help the little guy with his insomnia, but I didn't have any drugs on me, so the next best thing was to hypnotize him myself. But he wasn't quite asleep yet, so the next step of my plan was to sing a lullaby. However, I must have done a really bad job hypnotizing, because this monster gave me my first death of the run. But look, in my defense... I have never seen these attacks before. I ended up taking a wrong turn and found a room with whatever this thing is in a tree covered in icicles. And uh, let me give you a warning, interacting with this tree in the wrong spot saw flocks the game. So after going the correct way, we meet this fox guy who is totally just doing business with me and definitely not purely after my money. I pushed the loser aside, educated this no cone to not play with fire, then encountered two insomnitots which resulted in the run's second death. So after mashing through spammed and 2's dialogue, we are introduced to the 
Underground's postal service. They gave me a welcome letter, which I opened, then immediately deleted. And then we crossed paths with the Shufflers, a gang that won't let us proceed forwards. But instead of fighting them, we have to beat them in a shell game. I've generally been pretty good at shell games, so this was a walk in the park. With them stepping aside, we could enter Honeydew Resort, a small area filled with many NPCs, the first shop, a band, and even its own hot springs that we can't enjoy. After leaving the resort, we can cross as a random bridge puzzle, then encounter a Trihecta, which is actually just a Tri, Heck, and Toth stacked together. To spare these three, we just have to simply push them over. But something that isn't so simple is the second law of a rock puzzle. In this one, we have to move the platforms up and down to create a path for the rock to follow. But the problem is that this rock just kept sliding down the slope. It took me an embarrassingly amount of time before realizing, OH! I'M SO FUCKING STUPID! With that puzzle out of the way, we can finally fight Martlet, who actually has some pretty tricky attacks. But after surviving for a while, she unleashed her ultimate attack, which put me on the brink of death. Luckily, I did survive, because the following attack, she starts asking me to insult her. Yeah, I know that came out of nowhere, but stay with me. We learned during this fight that Martlet falsely arrested a girl who she thought was a human, and that girl scolded Martlet and was very aggressive towards her. So she thinks that us being mean to her will solve her problem of not wanting to fight someone who hasn't attacked her in any way. So yeah, I win the fight, and then she takes me over to a raft that will take us directly to Hotland. On this ride, she asked me to rate my experience with the Royal Guard, which I appropriately rated 1 star. Then we drifted off course, and crashed into a rock which sent me plummeting down into Waterfall. Well, I say waterfall, but this area is actually a massive desert. I'm gonna be honest, I've never really been a fan of big open areas which are most commonly deserts, but Doonbud sure improved my mood going forward because he's just looking for some fun. I can beat him by jiggling and patting his head, but was it worth it? I mean, this little guy is just so adorable. Moving forward, we run straight into a sandstorm which brings you all the way back to the start of this room if you get caught in it. In order to evade the storm, we have to hide behind these conveniently placed ruins. I wish I had more to say about this section, but that was really all there was to it. Continuing through the barren desert, we encounter a Sir Slither who believes he can help us out, but after doubting that belief, he leaves us alone. But someone who doesn't leave me alone though is Mo, who returns yet again to try and take my money. But I don't really care that much, so the only thing I can say to you Mo is, uh, no. After dodging some falling tumbleweed, we encounter Cactony, who lacks physical affection. I give him a pat between two of his spikes, and this marks the very first heal attack in this run. Sadly, we don't get to benefit from it much, because we have to keep progressing towards the barrier, which leads us straight into a mine. Because a piece of wood is jamming the elevator, we have to take a small detour to acquire a pickaxe. This character gives you one if you complete a three question quiz, but I failed after the course question, so that's out of the picture. Luckily, another worker just so happens to have a spare, so so after forking over 30 gold, we can smash the wood and the pickaxe and head on upwards. We immediately fight Bowel, and I'm gonna be honest, I got no idea how I spared this thing, but from looking back at the footage, I appear to console him twice, then give him a wash. There's a few minecart puzzles we have to solve up ahead, but it really didn't take a whole lot of brain power to complete them. I know this one looks intimidating, but just like the corn maze from the ruins, it's not as bad as you think it is. After the puzzles, we can exit the mines, ride another lift, then take the battle system and turn it into a a rhythm game. I'm not joking when I say this, but El Bailador took me several attempts. It's not that I'm bad at rhythm games or anything, but the controls for this boss just felt wrong to me. Like, you have to move between these three columns and press Z with perfect timing. That's pretty easy to understand. But it's not so easy to control when you realize that you have to hold each direction and let go of the arrow keys to return to the center. Maybe this sounds normal to everyone else and I just have a bad understanding, which in that case, fair enough, I'll openly accept that I'm completely wrong. But that's not going to stop me from blaming the controls for my three deaths to this guy. Yeah, I know three deaths doesn't sound that bad, but this is a pretty long fight and dying meant redoing the entire thing. I still had fun with this boss, don't get me wrong, but even as little as one more death could have changed my stance. After taking a lift back down, we find Violetta playing in some nearby flowers. She's not one for conversations, so I started a conversation, and that made her sparable. Not long after, we reunite with Marlet, and she actually follows us, which is something I wasn't expecting. We stumble across an oasis and finally meet Red, the girl Marlet falsely arrested earlier. Apparently, she's joining the Royal Guard now, so I left and got kidnapped by the Feisty Five. 
I wish I could talk more about these five, but I'm gonna be honest, I really didn't care for this section. It just felt like an unskippable side quest, and it didn't help that this section took forever. There were some cool aspects like a trolley problem that ended up just being a test, a boss fight with the feisty five, and you're probably wondering where the fifth guy is. So uh, long story short, these four don't like the way their leader has been acting, so they abandon the group altogether, which makes them depressed. So we have to follow him, and yeah, now we're fighting him too. This is where the area both got way more interesting and way more infuriating. There's a new battle gimmick with this lasso attached to us, which this moron ends up breaking halfway in, but this doesn't make the fight easier, no. This is where I died six times. His attacks are pretty fast, and I only had one healing item for the entire fight. I'm not gonna say that I was playing really well or that this boss was unfair, because I was playing like shit. But look, it's a brand new game, so we're all probably gonna be really bad on our first playthrough, especially with a new gimmick in play. Though I'll admit, it seemed like I was getting worse with each upcoming boss. Or maybe the bosses were just getting harder. After surrendering to Starlow, the Underground Postal Service notified us that we now unlock the ability to fast travel. Huh. I guess they aren't as irrelevant as I thought. We enter the steamworks with Soroba and are tasked with completing these energy puzzles to proceed. For the first one, I was just spamming random keys without even taking a moment to realize what I was supposed to be doing, and it surprisingly worked. I pretty much did the same thing with the next one, but I did have to think and correct any mistakes I made. At this point, Flowey was starting to get annoyed with all the sidetracking I was doing with these characters, and I kind of have to agree. My whole goal of coming here in the first place was to find the five missing humans, and while I don't mind the steamworks on that still feels like progression, the whole Feisty 5 saga was so unnecessary. The steamworks are full of robots, with the main one being Axis. It opens up the floor beneath us, and for the third time in this game, fall down to a new area. Here we can build ourselves a robot to make a companion for Axis, so after constructing this thing, we take a vent back up and encounter another robot. We spare Jandroid after cleaning him, and then make our way to my least favorite section in the whole game. And it's all because of one thing. Where the hell am I supposed to go? I was lost for a while, but before I knew it, I was back on the right track. We get chased by Axis, and after outsmarting him, we get chased by him once again in the very next room. Here we deploy our own robot, however Axis doesn't care at all for it. So Soroba moves to plan C, which is to blast off Axis' arms. But like, why couldn't you just do this the first time? Speaking of which, why can't you just do that to every robot we come across? Take Gusek for example. I don't want to have to change the record that vibe to the music with this thing. It wasn't too much longer until we had to fight yet another boss. Boss, this one being Gardener. The gimmick for this fight is that all of our buttons are blocked with vines, and we have to spend three turns each removing them. Just like the last two bosses, Gardener was giving me a lot of trouble. I was dying so early in the fight that I thought you just had to survive long enough, just like every other boss so far. But this one's unique in the sense that her dialogue stops after a certain point, so you have to free every button from our vines control. And that's not the end of it, because we also need to lower our offense level by pleading five times. I was honestly really nervous with this phase, because I had already used my only healing. And I had every right to be nervous, because I was one hit away from death when I won. Not even 10 seconds after beating her though, we have to fight another robot. Thankfully it's just a Telefist who will leave after changing the signal and watching TV, because I am getting so sick of these robots. Unfortunately for me, right after this we have to do work for another robot, play hide and seek with Axis, get separated from Soroba, and yeah, now we're fighting Axis. This boss introduces another new gimmick, and that's a shield. In order to progress this fight, we have to block attacks until this meter fills. Once we do that, Axis unleashes a powerful magic attack that we have to send right back into him. Repeat this a few times, trying to die 16 times like I did, and that's the battle. I gained a lot of respect for Axis and the Steamworks after this fight. It's still not my most preferred area in the game, but this is undoubtedly my favorite boss so far. We exit to Hotland, and this is where the story reaches its climax. Starlo and Edda the Feisty Five appeared just before we hop on the elevator. They were preparing a return party for Soroba, but when they were cleaning her house, they discovered something dark. She runs off, and we are tasked with investigating the secret room. Here we find out that Fabi was right about Soroba, because she was planning to take my soul all along. So yeah, we chase her to new home and try to reason with her, but of course that's not going to work. So after she knocks out Starlo and Martlet, we have to face her head on all alone. Soroba is brutal, and she had the most intense attacks in the entire game. Take the difficulty I had with access, multiply that by 10, and that's that's just how insane Soroba was. I did actually have healing for once, but I'd be going through all of them in the first four turns. 
For the first phase, that's right, this boss has phases, we just have to survive long enough until she channels her inner Azrael and brings her HP in the decimals. But right before she can deal the final blow, our determination shines and we can finally get our true soul's ability. In response, Soroba puts on a mask, transforms into this thing, and the true battle begins. To get through this phase, we have to attack her barrier enough times until it reveals these four yellow masks that we must destroy. Upon doing so, they send a beam flying towards us, which we can dodge with another new ability, which is the Sash thing. I'll be real with you, I forgot this even existed until the last phase, which is probably why I had so much trouble with her. But with the shield shattered, we can attack her mask to release a memory. Phase 3 is pretty much the same as phase 2, ending with yet another memory. And now we're on the last phase, which I started with 1 HP might I add, and this is where I had the most struggles. These attacks felt like fighting Sans for the first time, and to dodge them, you pretty much need to use that dash ability that I completely forgot about. Surprisingly enough, I died more to Axis than I did Saroba. Was it because she was easier, or was it because of my determination? After destroying her shield one final time, we can destroy that mask and beat the last boss of the run. We sit through a sob story, and our final mission is to cross the barrier and return home. However, deep down, we know what we must do. Crossing the barrier was impossible, and it wouldn't be fair to live down here in peace while the other humans lost their lives. And so, with Flowey's words flowing through her head, we say goodbye to our friends and offer up our soul to the king.